Hi, Dan. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Uh, okay. Can't, com you know, I mean, relative to 2019, can't complain. <laughs> yeah, it is all relative, and we're all alive, and I guess we should be grateful for that at this point. Um, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Dan Dresner, familiar to some Blogging Heads fans and or fans of the all too infrequently recorded show. <laughs> Dresberg. Yes, in uh, which where you share the stage with Heather Hurlbert. It's um, more like I bask in her glow, but yes. It is. She's I think you should be eternally grateful that she continues to permit that. Um but again, not as often as we might like. But I digress. You're also a, a professor at the Tufts uh, the uh, what's what's the name of the school of diplomacy at Tufts? The Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Author of numerous books. You want to mention a couple of your faves? Sure. Uh, most recently, The Ideas Industry, How Pessimists, Partisans, and Plutocrats are Transforming the Marketplace of Ideas. Uh, I also wrote The System Worked, How the World Stops Another Great Depression. And I guess my, you know, uh, sneaky favorite is, of course, Theories of International Politics and Zombies. Zombies, yeah. Um, so the way this, the, the conversation we're about to have started was on Twitter, as do so many things. Started on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I actually just hunted hunted down the exchange. So you and Corey Robin were having an exchange, and uh, he was talking about the prospect of a fundamental realignment where the I guess the Republican Party implodes and the Democratic Party becomes ascendant, but the left wing of the Democratic Party is ascendant within the Democratic Party. He called it a Sanders style AOC party, right? Um, and you said uh, something to the effect that uh, I guess you were applauding the possible implosion of the, or at least the Trump part of the, in any event, you said something affirmative about that. Uh, and he said, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, well, well, he said, be careful what you wish for. You will wind up with an ascendant left wing uh, kind of coalition running the, running the show. Yeah. AOC, Bernie Sanders. And you said, I know, uh, I'm writing something on why this would be awful from a foreign policy perspective. Mm -hmm. I chimed in and said, uh, uh, actually, I think a Bernie foreign policy would be a big improvement on the blob. I said, can't wait to argue with you about this, Dan. You said, can't wait to point out that the blob has become a lazy shorthand that characters for far more than it reveals. I didn't take that as a personal insult, Dan. It was not intended as a personal insult. Term. What's that? I said it was not intended as a personal insult, but I do not. honestly, I honestly think that when people say the blob now, it's like, you know, it's one of those, it, it, I think it's one of those terms of art, much like globalization or uh, deep state or fake news that frankly has, is, is so protean in its meaning that I never know, or neoliberalism, that's my personal favorite, that I'm never entirely sure what people are saying when they say it, so. That's... Okay, so that's what one thing we can we can talk about. I, uh, see, then after this, I said you wanted you want to talk about this on blogging heads, and you said yes. But looking looking back on it, I realized that it's a little ambiguous what we're going to <laughs> argue about, whether it's the existence of the blob per se, or whether a kind of left, kind of Bernie style foreign policy would be a good thing. But I think they're they're closely intertwined. I mean, I think if we start out talking about the blob, we'll wind up assessing Let, let's talk about the blob first and then we can talk about the second part because there's yep. a reason why i was pushing back on on uh, or not pushing back but disagreeing with Corey on this um which we, we let me first of all say we should probably define blob for those who don't know yeah. the term this application of the term comes from uh, apparently barack obama and ben rhodes in private conversation it refers to the foreign policy establishment and i take the blob image to mean two things that ultimately it's undifferentiated. You can talk about neocons and and liberals and so on, but they wind up supporting the same policies. A and B, as in the movie The Blob, although I'm not sure I've seen the movie. But anyway, it's inexorable, right? It's this it's this thing coming at you. Um, See, this is and and this is where I will start by pushing back. I the I. I am uncomfortable with the idea that one of the nice one of the, the reasons that the term the blob is appealing is precisely that, it, as you say, it makes it, it makes it seem like every foreign policy person in Washington has the exact same point, you know, points of view or that liberal internationalists will back up neoconservatives, will back up realists and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I guess I would 
push back on that in two ways. First, you know, in my opinion, there are plenty of people that you would consider entirely respectable members of the foreign policy community that would not necessarily hold views that would cotton to either neoconservatism or, for that matter, liberal internationalism. You can be someone like Chris Prabel at Cato, and I, I think he's a member in you know, good standing of the foreign policy community. He's certainly not a member of the blob. The second he's certainly not, but yeah. I think he would tell you that he feels like, uh, I actually just saw him, I suspect he would tell you that he feels that he is not uh, allowed into the true corridors of power, that, that the actual debate that governs what we wind up doing um, doesn't include his perspective in a meaningful way. Well, two responses to that. First of all, in my experience, everyone in the foreign policy community believes that they are marginalized or not, you know, their their view is somehow not uh, is being shut out of the corridors of power. Um, and indeed, furthermore, I would suggest that the very, you know, the the protest by so many people in the blob about the nature of Trump's foreign policy. One of the things I'm very amused by is is in some ways the sort of bank shot that a lot of people are trying to engage in to simultaneously criticize the blob. And also the way they criticize Trump is by saying Trump's foreign policy is not different from the blob. It's just the blob on steroids or that it's just the blob stripped to its naked essence, which does raise the question, if that's the case, why is the blob ostensibly or why are, you know, mainstream members of the foreign policy community by and large pretty damn hostile to the Trump administration? I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I so uh, this, this, this is I something I have that. Okay, good. First of all, I think they started off being more alarmed than they now realize they have reason to be. In other words, he has oh. wound up doing more, more of the blob's bidding than was originally envisioned. Oh, I would disagree strongly with that. I, I no, I do not buy well, that let's at take all. His, pol his policy on Iran is like a neocon's dream. I mean, it, now, now it, it, it's true that it's even even more hawkish, and th this 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 may be uh, is works on your side of the argument yeah. in the sense that it's even more, more hawkish than your liberal interventionists would like. I think mm -hmm. they'd say it's recklessly hawkish, uh, but it's a neocon's dream. I mean, I think in a lot of realms he has been captured by segments of the foreign policy establishment. Iran, I don't know how much capturing it took. Maybe this disposition existed during the campaign, but, but he's, he's, uh, he's almost a caricature of a neocon on Iran. When, whenever he tries to do something radical, like, I'm going to withdraw troops from Syria, it's like, oh, never mind, we'll leave 400 of the 2,000, and then three weeks later, never mind, we'll leave 1,000 of the 2,000. He, he can't, he doesn't seem able to successfully combat the blob. So again, this is where I don't, we're not talking about the blob here. Let's be very clear what we're talking about. We're talking about John Bolton and Mike Pompeo. Um, now, if you want to call them members of the blob, and I know there are certain foreign policy writers, and, you know, and I hear, I, I start blanking on the names. I think Stephen Wertheim is one who like, you know, claims that Bolton is a member in, in good standing of that, which again is rather odd because again, most people that I know that would be considered very blob-like don't have... Uh, you know, don't consider Bolton to be that kind of person. Um, so th this is certainly, I, I'm not going to disagree with you that, that Bolton and Pompeo have managed to get Trump where they want to, you know, him to be on Iran. The Iran policy, however, is not one where I necessarily think the blob is in agreement with what Trump has done. I mean, by and large, there was genuine debate about whether the Iran deal should have been, um, entered into. But I would also suggest that most of the people, even the people who were opponents uh, potentially of the Iran deal, were not necessarily crazy about the idea of sort of unilaterally withdrawing from it. Um, and there's no denying that neo some neoconservatives are perfectly happy to, to you know, with, with how the Iran policy has gone. But again, that's a tiny sliver, I think, of the blob. And to say that neocons supported it, ergo the entire blob be damned, is again one of those reductio ad absurdium arguments that I don't think is, is terribly productive. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not arguing that his Iran policy is kind of a uh, centrist blob. Mm -hmm. I, I would say it, it accords with the views of a significant segment of the, the blob, which I would say is the hardcore core neocons. I think there's a lot of neocons who are happier with what he's doing than they would have been with us remaining in the deal. That's 
probably correct. Um, I, I, I won't push back on that. But again, on the other hand, this points out that there are differences within this ostensibly homogenous community, which is to say that I would argue that the over, I would argue the overwhelming majority of, of sort of what we would consider foreign policy experts, if you polled them, would have opposed the withdrawal from the Iran deal. I don't think neoconservatives are necessarily all that large of a, a slice of it. Uh, I think I think that's true. I don't think he's done the, the bidding of a majority of the blob in the case of Iran. I think that's a good point. Um, I, what I would take, my definition of the blob hypothesis would be not that the entire U.S. foreign policy establishment agrees with one another on everything or everything of consequence. Um, it would, it, although, I mean, the Iraq war is a case where they pretty much agreed uh, among themselves on something of tremendous consequence that turned out very badly. And, and maybe that's where uh, the hostility of some of us toward the blob begins. But in oh, any event, yeah, I, would I think, think that, that is ground zero of hostility to the blob. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I think, frankly, there, there's a lot of annoyance that all of the people who favored the, the war are still, kind of running the show on the foreign policy establishment. The, there's, no, there's been no successful insurgency launched by the people who opposed it. And that, um, and, and, and an accountable system, generally speaking, the people who propose the disastrous things see their stature decline, and the people who oppose the disastrous things see their stature increase. That has not happened, right? Well, so, I mean, this is where I have to, hate to break it to you, but this debate happened 17 years ago. Uh, I agree. Uh, so I was, I was there. I was there, too. And I, I was a supporter of the war. And, you know, I was clearly wrong about that and, and cop to being wrong, which raises two, I, I think, issues. The, the first is, to the extent, I, I guess the question is, to what extent did people who supported the war back in 2002, 2003 move down a learning curve? In other words, to what extent... <laughs> You know, can you argue that someone circa 2019 is not necessarily going to make the same arguments that they would have made circa 2002? Um, you know, I, I, I'm very wary of the notion that once you declare something or once you have supported something in the past, even if you were wrong, that should damn you to, you know, oblivion, particularly an instance in which, as you point out, an overwhelming majority of the, you know, of, of the sort of foreign policy people supported this. Now, the, I think there are two inferences you can draw. One is everyone whiffed on it, that there was, you know, there was a, a significant error in no small part based on the information that was available at the time. Or was it a, you know, I, and I think this is where I, I start to, to get, I, I don't buy it. It's an argument of, oh, this is just a classic example of corruption and inbreeding and, and you know, um, a, a, an elite that is uh, designed to, pr you know, protect itself. Um, that is certainly a very popular argument to make now. Yeah, if you want to see, uh, uh, I think, a smart version of it, Steve Walt's most recent book, whose name is right. me, makes, the, makes that argument. Right, right, right. Um, you know, and again, Walt deserves his due on this because he was one of the people that was right, uh, you know, on, on Iraq. Um, and, you know, but on the other hand, I think he's frankly wrong about the Israel lobby. So, you know, it's not like people who have, uh, who were right. Uh, I am I am very wary of the notion that because you are right on Iraq, uh, that guarantees that you are going to be right on everything going forward in terms of foreign policy. And again, Although I will say, Dean, in my own case, I yeah. was right on Iraq and I've been right on everything in the world. All decisions in my personal <laughs> life. It's all been it's all been a really beautiful thing to watch unfold. But let me but seriously, I, I, this I think we're, we're approaching what I think is the anti blob critique of the blob is that we yep. in the anti-blob think that actually far from learning your lessons the the blob has actually evinced repeatedly a failure um to grasp uh some important lessons of iraq and let me give you two examples okay one and you can't attribute this to neocons because it was Hillary Clinton, although some of us might argue that the difference between her and a neocon is not quite as sharp as we might hope. But anyway, she was Secretary of State mm -hmm. when the decision was made to turn what was supposed to be a limited humanitarian intervention in Libya right. into a regime change operation. 
she had much support within the foreign policy establishment broadly. Disaster ensued. What does that have to do with Iraq? Again, well, regime change. That's what it has to do. The assumption that you're going to be able to unseat a regime and like s democracy will magically flourish or even order will magically flourish. Okay. So we would say that that was the same mistake. I would say two things in response to this. First, the, the notion that the foreign policy community was super eager to get into Libya does belie the fact that, in fact, the administration, if you recall, was sort of dragged into Libya, on, interestingly enough, by its allies. Um, that it was Britain and France that were much more eager to, to intervene in Libya than, uh, than the Obama administration. Indeed, even within the Obama administration, it was more the sort of humanitarian wing that, that wanted to get involved, again, precisely because of, of you know, the potential... Uh, looming disaster in Benghazi. The second thing is, is that I don't think you can talk about Libya without also talking about Syria, um, because Syria, I want to talk. I want to talk about Syria. Okay, That's because in some ways Syria is the flip side of this. Syria is the tale that the Blob would tell you, which is to say that okay, with, without in any way saying that Libya turned out great, because clearly it did not. Syria is the instance in which there was no intervention, at least originally, you know, as the situation descended from what was a civil society uprising into what becomes civil war, there are pressures to intervene and Obama, and this is the, this is the part where Obama sort of proudly thinks he's broken with the blob and, and, you know, decides he's, he's not going to intervene instead cuts the deal with Putin and so on and so forth. Um, it's not obvious to me that Syria turned out any better. And in fact, you can make a case that it turned out far, far worse. So oh, it did turn out badly. What I, what here's I, here's my point. It, As a social scientist, the lesson I learned from this is that maybe the, the lesson to learn is that it's not the U S military intervention is the crucial variable that leads to disaster. It's something else that's leading to disaster. It just turns out that U S military intervention doesn't necessarily have the salutary effect that uh, that many of its proponents might hope, but in that sense, that's a side for you know that's a, a data point for you. But I don't think that you know in the end these are all of these cases are what you know to use a technical term boil down to shitty choices. Um, and in some ways, that's the essence of foreign policy. It's it's making the best of a bad set of choices that are that are you know at your disposal. And so I'm not sure. They're pointing to Libya and saying, see, that was a disaster. We shouldn't have done that. That shows bad judgment. I don't necessarily buy that, I guess, because it's not clear to me that the alternative would have been any better. OK, so one more word on Libya I, uh, before I get to Syria. I would just say that uh, although it's true, we were, you know, quote, leading from behind in Libya and Obama himself maybe had to be dragged in. The fact is that once a decision was made to do it, there, it, it isn't like there are many people in the blob saying, no, no, don't, you know. That's fair. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So on Syria, um, I would say uh, it, it, this is this is um, one issue those of us in the anti-blob have with the blob is that everyone in the blob does say there was no intervention in Syria. There was an intervention. It was an intervention by proxy. But yes. weapons flooded Syria from outside, including the United States and and including uh, countries it considers its allies, although they had kind of conflicting aims. But this was not an example of not intervening. It was well, an example would, so, of intervening by proxy. Right. But I would say that in some ways, you know, again, it was not an instance in which it was an instance in which by by doing nothing necessarily at the start, it enabled the Assad regime to wind up taking what had been a peaceful protest and sort of guaranteeing that it was turning into a civil war. Now, if you want to say that not arming, you know, elements of the Syrian opposition would have been the better policy, that's, an, you know, I, I think the problem is, is that if you... I, I do want to say that, but go ahead. Okay. I mean, then, you know, so the scenario in that instance is essentially that Assad would have, you know, been more successful in cracking down on his population and there perhaps would have been somewhat, you know, less uh, of a humanitarian catastrophe. Is that your claim? Um, that's right. Before I elaborate on it, I would say that in a way, my conception of the blob hypothesis is that at a minimum, there are like ideas worth considering that don't get widely considered uh, in the blob. And, okay. and and the one you're we're leading to that you're we're leading up to is is a good example. Um, 
you don't have to accept my view of Syria, but I think you, as something of a realist in particular, mm -hmm. would at least believe it needs serious, it deserves serious consideration. And I think you'd agree it doesn't get, it's not like there's a lot of people in the blob saying, oh yeah, this is what we should have done. Yeah, I think in retrospect, um, now I, 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 I want to concede, first of all, it's not clear that we could have kept weapons out of Syria. The, a number of regional yeah. neighbors. And on the other hand, we have le leverage over a lot of them. So it, it's not clear that we couldn't have. But in any event, uh, just for purposes of the thought experiment, what I'm what I'm comparing is the situation we got with one where no arms uh, are, are going into the uh, what became the rebels in Syria. What would have happened? Assad would have brutally cracked down. He's he's a vicious uh bad person right it would have been ugly and horrors would have happened but i think they would have paled by comparison with the horrors we saw in terms of numbers of deaths number of refugees and by the way at the end of the day assad is still running he still has a state to run so it seems to me that it's almost a no-brainer that the, in fact eli lake actually agreed with me when i kind of cornered him on this on blogging heads and he said yeah maybe in theory or something and yet no one in the blog is raising this as a possible critique of what we did and and to those of us in the anti-blob that is mind-blowing it, it obviously deserves serious consideration but mm -hmm. there is no vigorous debate within the blob um i i, I mean I, so i if I'm trying to think how I would respond to this because again, it's not like Syria is my, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to dispute that with the benefit of hindsight, you have a, you know, you have a point, which is to say that knowing how things played out, if you could go back, would you have stopped funding, you know, uh, the rebels, would that have potentially been a less costly outcome in terms of, uh, on the humanitarian side, possibly on the other hand, you also had people who genuinely believed in, you know, who were very afraid of, of what would happen had Assad cracked down and wanted to resist the government and had attempted it in a nonviolent way and were then shunted in the only other possible form of resistance they had to say no to these people is not an easy thing to do. And I'm not nope. saying that you were, you know, you, you could have. It, it might still have been from a strictly realpolitik U.S. perspective, the best thing to do. Um, but that's, again, this goes back to the world of shitty decisions where, right. well, and, go, and yeah. I, I take your point on hindsight. It was a difficult situation. Right. And, and, and but all I'm saying is that yeah. in a properly functioning foreign policy establishment, mm -hmm. you do revisit these things and say, well, even if we can only see this with hindsight, let's see what we can learn. How might things have been different? This does not happen at all in Washington, D.C. I, because Dan, I, really can tell. That's I mean, do you really think that's true? I mean, you know, the, well, the I'm talking about on this particular issue with this particular okay. scenario, which I think you've just agreed is worth considering. Oh yeah, it's definitely worth considering. Does not get yeah. discussed much in Washington. Um, I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, I, you know, I, I, this is where this sort of talk about forever wars and the talk about, you know, fatigue in terms of, of U S interventions in the middle East, you know, I, I think you have people that, that even if they support it, you know, and, and this is one of the tricky things, you know, you talk about the U.S. Inter you know, intervention in Afghanistan at the time of the decision of the in to intervene. That's something that I think even the anti-blob was in favor of. You know, I mean, there was no denying the U.S. had been attacked mm -hmm. from someone in Afghanistan, you know, from from actors based in Afghanistan. It was entirely good and proper that the U.S. try to, you know, eject those forces. Um, well, my position at the time was that Bush was setting um, conditions so stiff for not invading Afghanistan that he clearly wanted to invade and he shouldn't have set such stiff conditions. But anyway, it, it, was, it was, look, it was, it, was a, it was compliant with international law. There was Security right. Council support. We had right. been attacked by someone being harbored by the Afghanistan government. It was far from the least defensible thing we've done in foreign policy. I, right. I, I agree. And, and yet we are now in year 18 of it. And I, I will say this, this is, I mean, this is at least from my perspective, the way in which my attitudes about military force have changed. At the time we were talking about Iraq and Afghanistan, it's worth remembering that the wars that we had, you know, waged in the 1990s, 
were wars that had been mercifully brief and, and usually it had come to a conclusion that didn't necessarily end with U.S. forces pulling out, but had the U.S. You know, playing the role of peacekeeper as opposed to constantly engaging in operations. You know, think what happened in, in Bosnia or think what happened in Kosovo. And, you know, if, if the 21st century wars should have taught, uh, you know, my fellow members of the foreign policy community anything, it's that those were the exceptions and not the rule. Um, and so that does make me ex much warier about the uses of force uh, going forward. But I would also, and this is something where I have my own bugaboos about this. I get why there, there, you know, there is the obsession with military force. Indeed, the militarization of American foreign policy is something that I've been decrying now for decades. So, you know, mm -hmm. this is not something I'm, I'm insensitive to, but it also leads to a certain skewer or, or a certain slant in the way in which we debate foreign policy, period, because foreign policy is a lot more than just the uses of military force. Um, Should be. There are, well, yeah, and there are other arenas where, again, I think what you would consider the blob breaks very strongly with what the, the administration has done. And so I, I you know, on, on no, behalf wait, wait, of- Say that again, you're, you're um, I miss that. There are parts, of, you know, the sort of non-military aspects of, of Trump's foreign oh. policy are so wildly at variance with what I would argue, you know, members of the oh, block sure. early advocate that this is this is why I get very uh, annoyed with people who came. Well, of course, the you know the the Trump administration's foreign policy is just the blob, you know, stripped of hypocrisy, which again I don't believe is true and I don't believe is accurate. No, I think there are things the blob genuinely objects to about yeah. Trump, certainly about his his style uh, and and things he said about NATO and so on. I mean, at the same time, in to, in some ways, they have had it both ways. Like, uh, you know, of course, we're we're talking after the issuing of the Mueller report, but up until then, um, there was a lot of complaint that Trump is doing Russia's bidding. But that the political pressure emanating from that had the effect of actually making him do uh, a couple of things that were kind of hard on Russia. You know, he he has not actually had a super Russia friendly. Um, policy. No, the, I mean, the, pol the policy has wound up being, in some ways, more hostile to Russia than, uh, exactly. than the Obama administration has been. There's no denying that. Yep. And so, and, and this actually gets to the interesting nature of of Trump's foreign policy. And and my lodestar on this is always, uh, I don't know if you know Elizabeth Saunders uh, at George Washington University. <coughs> Excuse me. She's the editor of the Monkey Cage. She has a. <coughs> she wrote a fantastic article about the relationship between a president and their foreign policy advisors, and basically the difference between in, an informed president versus an uninformed president. Um, and the compare and contrast she made was between George H.W. Bush versus George W. Bush, where this, the exact same advisors who were working in George H.W. Bush's administration in a relatively competent fashion when put in the same position or, you know, similar positions under George W. Bush, you know, wound up, you know, freelancing like you wouldn't believe because they knew that the president didn't know that much. Mm -hmm. And that's in some way, in some ways, you're now seeing that on steroids with the Trump administration, where there is no denying that there are areas where, you know, folks like Pompeo and Bolton have to kowtow to what Trump says. Think about North Korea. You know, that's something where Trump honestly cares about it or cares about, you know, the belief that, that he's conducting symmetry well. And so they have to swallow, you know, whatever objections they have and, and, you know, accord with his wishes. But it gives them free range across a wide variety of issues that Trump either doesn't know that much about or doesn't care that much about um, to be able to set policy as they see fit. And again, I don't think that the foreign policy community is necessarily, you know, is at best ambivalent about some of these things. And in some cases, not, you know, not uh, supportive of them at all. Um, in the case of Russia, you know, I, I don't think there's necessarily hostility to the ratcheting up of sanctions. Again, and in, in, in some ways, again, the, the release of the bar summary of the Mueller report justifies that because that's the one aspect of the report that is consistent with what preconceptions were, which is Russia did interfere with the election. Mm -hmm. So let me let me um, ask you about um, take this to a more academic plane, kind of. Yeah. Um, I, I would say there's another thing about Syria that, to my mind, is evidence of the blob at work. And it's the kind of language that was commonly used to describe it. I mean, this involves both Syria and Iran, but a kind of a standard talking point in some circles is Iran is the most destabilizing regime in the region or something like that. And not everyone in the blob says that. But it's like nobody takes exception to it. 
And I would just point out that, like, if you're a scholar of international relations, mm -hmm. then I would think that the one kind of working definition and perhaps the most prominent working definition of stability you have, right, is, is first of all, basically amoral, right? You're, it's not that, that you favor the maintenance of, of uh, good regimes. The definition of stability is that the regimes that exist at this point in time stay in power. Nobody starts a war. If you start a war, that's destabilizing, even right. if you start a war against a bad regime. Yes, Still, that's right. it, is the, it is the disturbance of stability that is, by definition, destabilizing. Now, mm -hmm. if you look at Iran's role, it is actually, it's not the one that destabilized the Syrian regime. It came into Syria at the invitation of the regime to try to end the uh, destabilizing effect. Now, I'm not, I'm not arguing in favor of any parties here. This is an amoral clinical analysis on my part. Mm -hmm. My point is just that the, um, you know, the destabilizing force in the strict sense of the, of the, the term emanated much more from us and our regional allies than it did from Iran, just destabilizing in the academic sense of the term. And yet, when people, and this is generally part of an ideological agenda when they say it, Iran is the most destabilizing country in the, in the region. That's, that's generally, you know, uh, political rhetoric. And none of these people in the foreign policy establishment, so far as I can tell, many of whom claim to, to be scholarly in their, in their kind of approach to things, None of them stand up and say, well, actually, that's a misuse of the term, right? Because if there's anything that advances uh, arguments in the foreign policy community, it's arguing about definitions. Um, well, no, but yeah. I mean, but this is no, a no, 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 point no. because that is yeah. a, it's a term. It's just factually incorrect. That's okay, fair. leave aside terminology. It's a factually incorrect statement that has political valence. Wait, but and, so, yeah. so I, I never hear. So, so it's interesting what we, you know, what we hear. You know, I, I take your point that that that's the the sort of language you hear. The language I tend to hear with respect to Iran is more that Iran has been the winner of instability in the region. In other words, that Iran, you know, is not necessarily the driver of it, but Iran has profited the most from it or expanded its influence the most from it you know, in the form of its intervention in Syria, in the form of whatever ties it has with the Houthis in Yemen, in the form of increased, you know, uh, increasing its fear of influence in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I do think that's correct. The question of how you deal with that is an entirely separate. Yeah, that's true. But it's never yeah. the one that creates the, <laughs> the instability. It just exploits it. You'd, yes, think, I, we'd quit, yeah. you'd think we'd quit creating it. Yeah. Us and our allies. Mm -hmm. You'd think you you know you'd think the Saudis would have said long ago, if we turn Yemen into chaos, we may <laughs> that may not be good for us. But they didn't. Actually, it, this is so. Wait, I am curious from an anti blob perspective. So, you know, if the anti blob is supposed to support stability and and supposed to not get you know avoid all these moral outrages, then then I don't understand why the anti blob gets so worked up about let's say the U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia. Because the U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia is a classic realpolitik alliance in which, you know, we supposedly share common interests, even though the nature of the Saudi regime is, is almost completely antithetical to what we would consider, you know, American values, as highlighted most recently by uh, the, uh, the assassination of uh, Anand uh, Khashoggi. Um, you know, and yet, you know, real, you know, that many blob critics have taken this to point out, to highlight, in fact, uh, that the U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia should be rethought, which I don't necessarily disagree with. But from a blob perspective, does strike me as odd because that's based on moral values, apparently. Now. I'm not I, I don't mean to say at all that the anti blob is not driven by moral conviction or does not make moral judgments. Mm -hmm. I was using the one example once we move to the terrain of academic language. Yeah. We're in amoral territory. Oh, and I was, uh, so I was just setting the context. Oh, okay. for that. Right. No, we, I can't speak on behalf of all anti blobbers. We are it's like I cannot speak on behalf of all blobbers, I would let. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, we are outraged. <laughs> I am outraged <laughs> by A, the way the forever war is actually making it more likely that America will be uh, the target of a truly consequential terrorist attack. Uh, 10, 20 years down the road when uh, like biological weapons have advanced and we're so distracted by all the bullshit 
generated by the blob that we don't have time to actually deal with, with that and try to circumvent the, um, the, the, the proliferation and development of biological weapons. As far as Saudi Arabia, uh, the outrage, I mean, Yemen alone is sufficient grounds for outrage, but, yeah. but also uh, gutter, I would add, it, but yeah. it's, it's, it's immoral what they're doing. Um, but there are other things you can point to. Saudi Arabia has, has, has funded uh, the spread of hardcore jihadist ideology. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, now, now maybe the maybe it may be true that MBS's one saving grace is that he's not going to do that. I don't know, but um, you know, but as, a, it, but as a ruler of Saudi Arabia, he's not the reliable type, or he's no. not nearly as so, reliable. So, so no, we are outraged. Uh, we're, some of us, we're, in some cases, we're outraged by different things, but but uh, our see the anti blob and the blob have a few things in common now. Well, yeah, again, I, I would I, think you as a when you're wearing your realist hat would would be inclined to argue, as I have, that realism, which is sometimes caricatured as being amoral, mm -hmm. is more, it makes the argument that um, it's the ideological manifestation of realism as opposed to the descriptive side, is, is that, um, that its ideology um, does lead to less human suffering in the long run, right? That's a moral position. Yes, yes. I, I mean, it's a utilitarian one, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's basically a utilitarian yeah. argument of, we should not intervene. We should husband our power, both because it serves our interests and also war, as we understand it, is such a you know an appalling monstrosity that it it uh, uh, it surely we should side on you know we should uh, all else equal we should side on in the more risk averse mm. uh, exercises of power. So there's a lot of I could go to other regions and so on and 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 and, and other subjects and argue that there just should be more vigorous discussion than there is. And in fact, one of them is the proliferation of. Uh, things like biological weapons, there's not much forward thinking in the, in the DC foreign policy establishment, you know? Okay, hold on. I'm not going to, this is where I, I think you've gone off the rails because I don't, the, there's plenty of people in the DC foreign policy establishment who have thought about that. Not that I can necessarily name them off the top of my head because it's not my bailiwick. I'd be more persuaded if you could, but go ahead. No, no, no. But, but part of that is also, again, and this is a distinction, it's that, you know, if you're in the foreign policy community right now, and you're trying to, you know, it is impossible to think beyond a few months because we're dealing with an administration that is careening from one crisis to the next, not necessarily handling anything well. And in some ways, all we're trying to do is try to preserve what few elements of the status quo Trump isn't trying to to muck up. And this is one of the natures of, of the this is one of the paradoxes and actually one of the things I, I sort of disagreed with Corey Robin about. Um, and agreed with Corey Robin about, you know, because we have debates about this. Corey's point, which I think is actually a really good one, is that by and large, Trump is a fundamentally weak president, um, which is to say, despite the fact that, you know, he his party controlled both the House and Senate, he actually got remarkably little accomplished um, in his first two years of office. He very often says things that, you know, his rhetoric is awful, but also it often winds up there being no follow through. He'll tweet something and then nothing actually happens or it gets shut down. Or there was a great article in the Washington Post, I think last week about how a lot of Trump's deregulatory moves um, have actually been slapped down by the courts at a much higher rate. Um, like the, I think Trump's success rate, his, his Justice Department success rate is something like 6%, whereas with Obama, it was like 60% um, because these guys are just so bad at it that they wind up losing a lot of the time. The one area where I don't think this holds, though, and this is where I disagree with Corey, is actually in foreign policy. And this is part of a problem that predates Trump. Um, and, and in some ways, I, here is something where I, I think the blob does uh, share some guilt on, which is that in the decades prior to Trump, essentially, as you know, partisanship and polarization affected other institutions, particularly Congress, the way that the foreign policy community responded to this was essentially to advocate the allocation or abrogation of more and more power to the presidency mm -hmm. with the thought that the president was essentially the last adult in the room, that the president would surely, as the executive, you know, not necessarily make all the right decisions, but at least have some sort of, you know, far reaching vision and try to act in the best interest of the country. And therefore, when it comes to questions of war and peace or questions of trade or, or what have you. You know, Congress in some cases voluntarily and also in some cases urged on by the foreign policy community ceded powers to the presidency. 
The problem is that we now have a president with the emotional maturity of a three-year-old. Um, and we are witnessing the, the horrible effects of what happens if you construct this incredibly powerful machine designed for an adult and instead give it to a kid who thinks he's in a bumper car game. Yeah, I mean, if I had my druthers, we would constrain U.S. militarism with uh, legally. With, with, there would be more legal constraint at two levels. Right. One is that Congress's rightful and constitutionally mandated role in declaring war yeah. would be taken more seriously. Right. A, and then B, at the level of international law, I would like to see us um, – take seriously the idea that you, you don't get to attack a country unless either it attacks you or the Security Council grants you authority. If we had abided by that, we wouldn't have invaded um, Iraq. You can argue over whether uh, the morphing of uh, the Libyan mission into regime change violated that uh, uh, resolution. The, the UN mandate. I think you could make the case it does. But in any event, I'd like to see international law taken seriously by at least some significant fraction of the blob and yet evidence that it isn't is the following no one no one ever says i mean it, an another kind of standard thing for the administration at least to say without a whole lot of challenge is this the the iranian presence in syria is intolerable well actually that fully accords with international law the syrian government invited it in what doesn't accord with inter with international law is is the repeated Israeli airstrikes against the Iranians and Iranian proxies in Syria. Those are violations of international law. The Iranian presence is not. Now, if you want to argue that this is such a grave menace to Israel, I disagree with that premise, but if right. you want to argue that it's such a grave threat to uh, Israel that we have to cast international law to the side, you can argue it. I would still like to see someone in Washington of influence in some think tank, but I honestly don't know what think tank to even hope that this would happen in. Oh, it'd be Cato. No, that, that somebody would really uh, be the kind of international law school marm, you know, that I am. Um, you know, like pointing out what is and isn't in accordance with international law. There's no think tank that I can think of that's, that's devoted to that. Or yeah. even has... has somebody they've given a big pedestal to. Well, there are universities and so on and so forth, but that, right, that's not exactly. the point. They're yeah. universities. Those people yeah. aren't in the blob. But I would also say, by the way, and you know, this gets to a, a slightly different issue, which is if you're trying to make the argument that Iran's entry into Syria was in accordance with international law, whereas U.S. interventions in the form of arming rebels was not. That was, not what, I, that was not what I said. Or Israeli I, action. I said Israel's actual airstrikes on Syrian territory right. violate international law. The my arming point is, of the rebels is a cloudier case. In right, but, but I guess my point is these are not really stellar advertisements for international law. Um, which well, is, that's your view. That's your view. I think you could have a whole argument yeah. that the that, uh, the Iranian uh, presence in Syria is largely a deterrent presence from Iran's point of view. Uh, that's another thing where I'd at least like to see the argument had. I Th guess. I'm not, you're, rolling, you're rolling your eyes because... Well, I'm not sure how you're saying it's a deterrent. Your what is it, that's what is it a deterrent for? What? what is Iran, who is Iran deterring by being in Syria? They fear attack from the United States and from Israel, and they really do. It's hard to imagine because we never put ourselves in their shoes. No, no, no I understand that. I, I, again, if you want to get terminological here, I, the use of the word deterrence is not appropriate here. Um, you want to say that Iran is acting to, to defend its interests. That's something entirely different. There's no deterrence here um, because, you know, Iran was not, you know, and if there was deterrence, it was a failed deterrence. Okay, let's call it a buffer. Let's call it a okay. buffer. My point First is, of my okay. point is that no one takes, no one discusses much, so far as I can tell, the possibility that from Iran's point of view, this is largely forward defense. The assumption is that no, it is a clear and present danger to Israel. Iran could well attack for first. Iran has actually never shown the proclivity to do things like that, but that is the assumption. And, and again, Dan, I'm not saying I'm right. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, saying you want to have the argument I'm throwing out there deserve to be part of a debate that would be happening in Washington if the foreign policy establishment were functioning as it should. Maybe, I guess, I mean, here I can't speak for the rest of the foreign policy community. My reaction to what you're saying is, of course, Iran is going into Syria to defend its interests. That's not a terrible shock, but, but 
the the response to that is well iran's interests and u.s interests and you know happen to clash so in that instance um you know it's what interest of what interest of america's is threatened by the presence of iranian troops in syria exactly i'm not saying there are none but which ones do you have in mind I mean, much in the, you know, I would say a few things. First of all, the hope originally was that you had a Syria that was potentially not going to be under the thumb of Assad. That would have certainly have been a desirable outcome from a, from a U.S. perspective. Um, the second is, is that a successful Iranian intervention in Syria gives it more autonomy precisely because it allows the placement of troops, you know, not just with, on Iranian soil, but closer to Israel. Um, and again, which is not to say that Iran would have automatically moved aggressively towards Israel, but it gives Iran more options. Yeah, it does. Well, I, I mean, I, I, uh, you know, my view of international law is that there sh it should be taken sufficiently seriously, or at least there should be someone in Washington who agrees with me that it should be taken sufficiently seriously, that the things you just mentioned, oh, this gives Iran more options. This gives Syria more autonomy. Those are not grounds for launching airstrikes that kill people and violate international law. I would love it if there was somebody in Washington who said stuff like this. Okay. And I mean, don't you agree that there, don't the things I'm saying deserve debate? Yeah, I don't necessarily dispute that. Um, Do you agree they're not getting it? Uh, perhaps on Syria, but again, this is where, you know, me as a, you know, as I suppose as a, uh, the, the representative of the blob would protest that, you know, if you want to criticize the debate about Syria, that is perfectly fine. And I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that, you know, maybe you want to hear more voices about what the, the U S should do. Although again, it's worth pointing out that the troops on the ground that you're objecting to at this point have nothing to do with Iran, have nothing to do with, you know, Syria, they had everything to do with, you know, fighting the Islamic state. Um, and whether or not, if you remove those troops, An another reason we should let them handle the thing, maybe. Yeah, but go ahead. Um, but no, basically what I don't like is this notion of, well, because the, you know, we don't like what's going on in Syria, we can therefore dismiss the blob in its entirety or, you know, it, that, that essentially you're treating Syria as a, is it synecdoche or synec, I can never know how to pronounce that word. When I don't know the definition, I don't care how it's pronounced. So. Okay. <laughs> you're treating it as the, the exemplar of what the blob thinks. And again, I think Syria is not an exemplar of what the blob thinks. Well, I think Syria is a case where the foreign policy community doesn't have a great set of possible answers. It's just a whole, you know, it's a, it's a choice from the best. Right. But my argument is that that's because there are things, and I don't just mean Syria, I mean Iran, I mean Saudi Arabia, and by extension, the whole Middle East. Uh, the reason they don't have maybe the reason they don't have great solutions is because there are se serious ideas that just don't make it into that chamber. I think there are actual genuine debates about what our policy should be vis-a-vis -vis Iran. I think there should genuine policy debates about what they should be. Vis -vis who's the closest Saudi to my, who's the closest to the kinds of things I've said in Washington? Um, I would, you know, among others, Heather Hulbert, I think, is, you know, certainly uh, afforded skepticism. I haven't, I haven't heard Heather say these things. Maybe I've missed it. But, and, but know, I love it. Well, Heather, welcome aboard. I'll tell you what, next, Lynch, time, you know. next time you and Heather talk, mm -hmm. we can see if she parrots me. I encourage well, her. Also, by the way, this does give rise to, uh, this actually suggests something else, which is, and this might be a, a, this would be a potentially appropriate indictment of the blob, although I would also say it's an indictment of the anti-blob as well, is that particularly when it comes to the Middle East, is the tendency of foreign policy people to have a debate about what options are almost you know, putting to one side the actual regional area experts, um, because they will probably, you know, uh, offer somewhat different perspectives. But, um, and, and so in that sense, you know, that, that, that's, you know, one potential issue. Although I actually think this is a problem for anyone who talks about American foreign policy, regardless of whether they're part of the blob or not. Um, but yeah, you know, you're not going to get me saying, you know, we should ignore the experts. I'd rather defer to regional experts in, in many of these. Instances. Speaking of regional experts, I have a question that uh, I, I don't think you consider yourself a China expert, but you know more about it than I do. This is a genuine question. Like, yep. I, 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 I worry that there is something closer to a consensus on the need to be hawkish toward China mm -hmm. than may be necessary. But I genuinely don't. Yep. I don't know the terrain. So my one question is, I mean, we all know that Taiwan is fraught. Um, but but what what I don't I I honestly don't understand is like the way China keeps creating these islands and occupying them. Mm 
-hmm. What is the feared outcome of that? I mean, what do they wind up doing with that that would be deeply problematic from our point of view? I think there are probably two concerns. One is um, that you know, by doing this, they could potentially would be able to, to project power in terms of vital waterways. Uh, an awful lot of sea commerce goes through, you know, that part of the, the world. And so there are allies, not to mention the United States, you know, that I think would be worried about what would happen if, if China exerts more, uh, you know, China basically acts as the toll collector um, there. Not that they're doing that necessarily, but if they're moving that In direction. what form would the toll collection take? You mean literal toll collection? Like no, no. I mean, but like, canal or? No, no, no. But like, again, it's a question of, do you want to be reliant, you know, to, to what extent would you be worried that in a more serious crisis, China would choose to shut down the Straits of Malacca and or, you know, the South China Sea to, uh, to commerce? That would not necessarily have uh, great implications. The second, um, concern I think is the precedent or the 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 question of if China gets its way on the South China Sea on the, the sort of Scarborough Shoal and these other islands, will they infer from that that in fact the US will in the end acquiesce as well on the East China Sea, on Taiwan, on any, you know, further uh, extension of, of mainland control over Hong Kong and so on and so forth. Um, and to what extent will China decide they want to push out um, the United States from what is considered the inner island chain um, to the outer island chain and then continued expansion? Yeah, I mean, I'm still, I mean, getting back to Taiwan does does raise the one area where there's clearly tension. But aside from that, um, I don't know. It, it's like uh, the idea that, okay, they would then have the power to shut down a commercial corridor i mean you know in general i mean first of all and also by the way the power to basically decide the south china sea is a chinese lake as opposed to you know for someone who believes in international law as opposed to an international waterway which according to the u.n convention on the law of the sea is what that area is right now yeah well i'm i'm for preserving respect for international law i don't think we're in much of a position to demand it given how uh carelessly we no, we've right. handled this badly, but I would point out that a ruling by the UNCLOS Tribunal w went against China, and China has ignored it. We, uh, and that was a ruling on what? On uh, uh, on the South China Sea, on the Spratleys, I believe. Okay, well, then I'm against what China did there. And okay. I'm, I'm standing firmly against what China did. And, but also saying it would be easier to criticize them if, if the U.S. made a serious effort at actually cultivating respect for international law, which you, you know, I don't think anybody can argue. No. Done. I mean, in general, though, the thing about the possibility that they would kind of have the power to uh, control this corridor, I, I mean, one issue I have with, um, you know, I think a, an assumption that drives a lot of American foreign policy, which is that the U.S. must eternally maintain its dominant position, is that we can't countenance the possibility that we may have to, at some point in some regions, accept the role that we have long demanded that the rest of the world or large parts of it accept, which is that we are the ones who have the power to shut down the most stuff. We mm -hmm. expect people to live with that and not go to war over it. We can shut down a lot of stuff. We abuse our control of the banking system and so on. But, you know, well, this is actually, it's going to last forever. And now you have come across perhaps the crux of why the blob, uh, you know, is so hostile to the Trump administration, which is, as you point out, right. one of the tightrope acts that the, the United States has managed to walk for decades, and this is perhaps the very single best thing that the blob has done, has been the fact that the U.S. controls, has, has so-called command of the commons, you know, has a number of levers of power that only the United States can exercise. And that pretty much the rest of the world has been okay with that because the United States has by and large been restrained in its use of these sort of levers, which is to say we are not going to use them, you know, unless absolutely necessary. And if we do use them, we will traditionally rely on allies, build multilateral coalitions in order to be able to show that we're not just going to do this on a whim. The problem with the Trump administration is that they're doing it on a whim. And so, therefore, it is forcing every other country in the world to start rethinking, you know, the degree to which they need to, you know, allow the United States or rely on the United States um, for the stable and responsible exercise of power. And we're closing to the end. So, by the way, I'll close with this point, which is this is why I was wary about the Bernie Sanders thing in terms of him, you know, his foreign policy. It's not his foreign policy, per se, 
Um, I'm for one, actually, I like Matt Dust, for example, who Bernie Sanders hired. I think Bernie Sanders is taking foreign policy far more seriously now as opposed to 2016 when mm -hmm. what he was saying was a joke. Uh, it, it's not a joke anymore. I, I take it seriously. So this is not a criticism of, of Sanders per se. What my fear is, is that the sort of de increase in polarization is causing, will cause a ping-ponging of presidents, which is to say if you have Trump replaced by Sanders and then Sanders, let's say, replaced by an even arch-conservative version of Trump, American foreign policy is going to look bipolar and not in the bipolar distribution of power way, but in the bipolar disorder way which is to say that we are, we are no longer going to be able to credibly commit to anything because since we've abrogated so much power to the president and since the president will, you know, be from one extreme or the other, you're going to see constant, you know, uh, oscillations in terms of America. And what are the parts of, the, of a Sanders foreign policy that you fear that would most thoroughly manifest that, that other extreme? Um, I mean, I'm trying to, th you know, this is where... You know, so for, let me put it this way. You know the Mexico City policy? No. Okay, the Mexico City policy, that's sort of a standard tradition where if a Republican gets elected, they implement the, Me I think they implement the Mexico City policy, which says the U.S. will no longer aid any development agency uh, that, you know, offers family planning, including abortion, um, that, you know, will cut that off. If a Democrat gets elected president, they immediately flip that policy and so on and so forth. Now, for a couple of things, that's perfectly fine. I mean, that, that you know, you're, you're voting based on party. Whoever mm -hmm. wins will do that. My concern is, is that you are going to increasingly see all of foreign policy along those lines. Yeah. Um, you know, so Bernie will rejoin the Paris Climate Change Accords, which will be great. I don't have, a, I'm not opposed to that I'm right up until the moment that the next Republican president is elected and then tries to withdraw from it. Um, you know, my, Bernie my, will rejoin the Iran deal. I would hope so. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. again. My problem is not with Bernie per se. My problem is the wider, you know, issue of polarization and a sort of left-right, um, you know, oscillation of, of presidents. And uh, I, I guess I can reveal this. I'm going to have an article in the next issue of Foreign Affairs that discusses this problem. In the, ping the ping pong problem? Yeah, the ping, ping pong, pong problem. Ping uh, pong intermittent diplomacy? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well... Thank you, Dan. I'm glad that I persuaded you that I'm right and you're wrong. It, it only took a moment. <laughs> um, uh, you, should, you should do one of these with Heather sooner than you might have been otherwise inclined to, so that you can ask her if she agrees with me on Iran. Then she'll have to go back and listen to this. Uh, okay. And I predict that she will not say unambiguously that she does agree with me. But if she does, that's the making of, of the kind of coalition that could uh, revolutionize Washington. The revolution begins here. Um, so thanks so much. And oh, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, they can find me at Dan Dresner. Okay. I'm Robert Ryder, W-R-I-G-H-T-E-R. Thanks a lot. And uh, I will see you soon. Take care.